right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another day. Another day to be alive, another chance to bring you glory before we're with you face to face. Father, we thank you for letting us gather this way in a protected environment with your spirit and your word as a family. We ask that you guide us this evening by your spirit, of course, help us learn what you have for us so we can be better prepared in this world to defend your gospel and to bring you glory. And Father, most of all, we're thankful for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, once for all to pay our debt so that we who trust in him are yours forever by your grace. We are so grateful, Father. Please bless us all right now as we listen to your word. It's in Christ's precious name we pray by the power of your spirit. Amen. The Power of Deception, Part 2. So let's start this uh, way this evening with an important question. How did it happen? How did it happen? Hopefully you know what I'm referring to from the last couple lessons. Maybe someone here is saying, what did I do? I didn't do anything. But in context, how did it happen? that we were deceived, many of us, in a way that really we wouldn't suspect. So I'm going to speak for myself here. How did I get to a point in my soul that I didn't think one should knowingly and willingly bring children into this world? How did I get there? That, and that's something that just like ponder. How did I get there? How did that happen? How much time did that take? What steps did the kingdom of darkness take in my life maybe over the years to sway me into a false perspective? Here's another important question. Was I looking at the seen or the unseen? Was I looking at the seen, the things you can see, or the unseen? which is what God wants us to look at. Was I judging by the appearance or was I going by what God's word says on the matter? I think we know the answer. And that's our, one of our weaknesses in the flesh is we judge by the appearance. And by the appearance, it doesn't look like we should bring children into this world because of A, B, C, and D. But that was an adopted false perspective that I carried unknowingly up to this point, but it was an earthly perspective, which did not bring glory to God in that area of my life for years. Think of, uh, I think of conversations I had with people over the years about the topic and maybe actually discouraging having children or saying something like I would never have children in this world, right? Like, and what, what, what was I just peddling? What thought system was I just passing on? So, you know, God, by His grace, is so patient. We'll get to that a little bit later, too. But as we saw on Mother's Day on the board, in God's eyes, having children is a huge blessing and gift. For example, Psalm 127.3. It is a huge blessing and gift in God's eyes. What a privilege to bring a new God-given life into this world if you partake in that in any way. And if you're a believer, you'd be hoping that your child, the one God gave you, would grow up and bring tremendous glory to our God and Savior. How awesome to have a hand in that. Perspective is everything, isn't it? How awesome to have a hand in something like that. Where, yeah, the world is, quote-unquote, a horrible place. Um, there's a lot of lack of faith. There's a lot of evil things going on. But what if your child, or if it's not your child, it might even be someone in your family that you have the privilege of influencing with divine perspective. What if your child grows up to be that light, that beacon on the hill amidst all the darkness? 
What a privilege, right? So perspective is truly everything, and God just keeps graciously shining things, shining lights on things that we need to see in our own souls. And he did it, of all things, through a nice Mother's Day message. And these things just came out. Uh, I was sharing with Pastor, and he agreed that the perspective of the Christians in India is this point, godly perspective on the board. They consider it such a huge gift and privilege to have even one, like Madhava said to Pastor. We were only blessed with one. But that's that perspective. We've been skewed in this country. So back to the big question we started with, how did it happen? How did it happen? How do we get here from maybe when we were younger having a different perspective on it? It simply was the result of listening to the incessant lies of the world and possibly coupled with our giving in to fear and worry and our own earthly rationalism from our bad roommate, our old sin nature whispering in our ear, the kingdom of darkness. This world, especially through the media, offers us non-stop lies. And the more we listen, the more we, you know, open up to listen to the things in the world that are available for us to listen to, to pass the time, or whatever reason we do it, the more we open ourselves up to these nonstop lies coming at us. And remember, Satan always mixes the truth with lies. So it's going to be appealing. It's not going to be always obvious that there's a lie coming into your soul. So once again, we have to guard ourselves. And as one very evil man said, possibly possessed by Satan himself, Adolf Hitler once said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. So we got to be careful what we listen to, folks. And over time, that was a lie that settled into some of our souls about having children. Without clinging to God's word, that's what happens even to believers in Christ. The key word is clinging. Without clinging to God's word on a daily basis, this is what happens, even to believers. Uh, look what just happened to us. Uh, many of us bought the lie that having a child is a burden in this world. So instead of simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ, some of us slipped into perverting God's gifts and staying in selfish love for self-preservation. As Pastor said on Tuesday, this is the reason for these lessons on deception, even coming from a beautiful lesson of appreciation on Mother's Day. Our main point on Tuesday was this, regarding satanic deception. We must always remember that Satan is a master of deception. The most effective deceptions are the least obvious. Only the Word of God is able to shine on them, shine light on them to reveal their insidiousness. On Sunday, Mother's Day, the Word set us free from this particular deception, and only the Word can set us free. Think about it. God designed life so that in this world, the only thing that can set you free is His Word. God set up life like that. There's no other solution. There's no other alternative. Now, at least we know the truth, right? It's not like we're wondering where are the answers. But God said, it's straight up. This is it. This is, this is the alternative. And if you seek, you will find. It is so simple, and it's also the only way, just like Jesus called himself the way. It's the only way in this world to have truth and therefore freedom and peace, etc. And it truly is on the board, God's way or the highway. It really is. There's no third option, right? There's no third option that might be okay or pretty good. Turn to God and His Word with a humble heart and find truth and freedom. Or arrogantly ignore His Word and inevitably 
inevitably live in deception and lies and slavery. You know, someone can think they're a good person on their own and say, I do the right thing, and, and I'll never fall for the lies that you're talking about right now. But it is truly inevitable if they avoid the word, if they evade the word, whatever, ignore the word, it's inevitable. You will be trapped in a whole bunch of lies and not know it. I mean, we, we get caught and we get, see things that we've been doing wrongly, right, over time, and we're in the Word. So just thank God again. He's patient with us. And regarding the point on the board, Satan's going to do his best to not make it seem like slavery. Okay? For example, again, turn to God and His Word with a humble heart and find truth and freedom. Period. Or arrogantly ignore His Word and inevitably live in deception and lies and slavery. But Satan has a way of deceiving people into thinking that it's not so bad. The world's ways aren't so bad. I'm getting what I want. I'm collecting all this stuff. Um, I'm making it happen. Yeah, when I hit the pillow at night, I'm kind of miserable and wondering, but I'm, you know, living in denial pretty well. That's not what they think they're doing, right? <laughs> but they're like, this isn't that, that bad. I mean, you, got, you Christians are missing out. You people sticking in with the word, you're missing out. So Satan's got, you know, a lot of people duped. He has a way of making slavery look like freedom. And that's what deception does. As with so many in this world today, they bought it hook, line, and sinker. So much so they don't even know what they're in. And I was thinking about that expression that we use, hook, line, and sinker. And if, you, if you've ever fished before, you might know what this is about. But I was fishing one day with a friend years ago, and his little kids were there. And we were fishing in this pond, and I, I got a fish on the line. So I called one of the kids over. I said, hey, come on over and reel the fish in, right? But my mistake is I stopped reeling myself. And what fish do, they're so stupid. Not only do they get hooked, but then if you stop on the pressure, they swallow the hook. And they swallow it hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> really. <laughs> if you don't know fishing, there's a little sinker above the hook. Okay? They literally swallow the whole thing. And that's what's going on in the world. That, like it's obliviousness to a lot of people. Our only hope is the Word. And we need to do our best to share that with people before they're so hooked. <laughs> Excuse the pun, but it's just horrible. It's slavery. Even though it looks good, that, that piece of bait on that hook looks good. But it's truly slavery. So to our main point, Satan and his deceptions are insidious. And I looked up that word insidious because I'm like, what's insidious? I think I know what insidious is, but Merriam-Webster says this, awaiting a chance to entrap or treacherous or harmful but enticing, seductive. I think of Satan as a lion lying in wait for his prey crouched really low and quiet in the tall grass. Even the Apostle Peter wrote that the devil is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And that is spiritually, devour their soul. And that's the worst kind of suffering, is spiritual suffering, which leads to eternal death even. And so this is Satan's way. He is insidious. He is evil. He'll take whoever he can down with him. And he's crouching, waiting for the next victim. But the point that came out on Tuesday so strongly, and it's been coming out for years now, is only the word can shine light on the crouching lion in the grass that's only 10 feet away from you. That's the great thing about lions. They're great hunters, right? They are so quiet, and they are so still, and they can get down so low that the prey thinks absolutely nothing is wrong. 
until he hits. And that is what we're dealing with as believers, as anyone in this world is dealing with. That type of deception of Satan that is so powerful. But only the light can shine the spotlight on that lion that's nearby and give us that perfect wisdom to point out deceptions that we're even accepting in our own souls. And this latest deception the Word has rescued us from should make us wonder what other deceptions we've been carrying around. Now, don't panic. <laughs> don't be, like, condemning yourself. But there are other... Do you think this is the last one that the Spirit has brought to the light? Every... I don't know how, I don't know how often, but every so often over the years, he keeps bringing out another one, a wrong perspective that we've had. And by grace, he changes our perspective with the light of the word. So you think this is the last one? Of course not. But by grace, the Spirit says one at a time. Thank God for that, right? If you stick with me and my word, I'll reveal them all to you in due time. By grace. So he's cleansing us. He's purifying us. He's making us think more purely like Christ in all these different areas, including recently about having children. And as a side note on the board, May we never forget how gentle and patient God is with us as we go on this journey with Him. This is something we should thank God for every day, especially when we see a perspective that He had to correct in us that really, you know, we shouldn't have had in the first place. We should thank God every day how gentle and patient He is with us on this journey. I mean, we might be jerks in a certain area, of life, uh, thinking the wrong thing in a certain area, but he's so patient and long-suffering. And because we're following him, because we're seeking him in his word, right? He's like, okay, I'll show you. I'll give you piecemeal, a little at a time, because you can't handle it all right now. You probably condemn yourself. But let's never forget this point on the board. What an awesome God we have. That's part of his awesomeness, his grace. So the Apostle John helped warn us on Tuesday about the great deceiver and his ways. We know from Revelation chapter 12 that Satan deceives the whole world. We know from John chapter 8 that Jesus called the devil the father of lies. So this is who we're dealing with. Someone very powerful and very deceitful. So turn in your Bibles to 1 John 3 verse 7. And let's read this passage, which also is another warning about deception. 1 John 3, verse 7. Again, in Revelation 12, we heard Satan deceives the whole world. And in John 8, Jesus called the devil the father of lies. Let's see what John says in 1 John 3, 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. But he starts out in verse 7, Little children, make sure no one deceives you. Regarding these things that we just read about. Make sure no one deceives you. Another point the Spirit brought out is that deception and love are mentioned in several passages in close proximity. We just saw that in that passage right there. Verses 7 through 11. We see watching out for deception and then loving each other and how love is a sign of a true believer. So don't be deceived. On the board, part of Satan's deceptions is to keep us from the love of God. This is one of his main objectives. Part of Satan's deceptions is to keep us from the love of God. 
Think of the love that was just attacked by our deceptions on having children in this world. We were, if we're in that camp, attacking the love of God, his ways of revealing love to the human race. We attacked the family structure by holding the wrong perspective. And that includes God's love coming forth in children as a great expression of his love. So again, on the board, part of Satan's deceptions is to keep us from the love of God. And this was on my heart before Tuesday's lesson, actually, that one of Satan's main weapons or tactics is fear. Many of you know that. One of his main weapons or tactics is fear. He wants to get us to fear. What does Satan want us to fear the most? Arguably, it's that the love of God will fail us. That the love of God will fail us. Even as his children, even as his believers. That's one of the irrational fears that Satan would like us to, you know, cling on to, to keep in the back of our mind, to doubt. That the love of God could possibly fail us. Satan would love nothing more than for us to doubt and fear losing the love of God. But the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, gave us a whole wonderful series to remind us that nothing can separate us from the love of God and the love of Christ. So take that, Satan. There's one down that the Spirit prepped us, maybe. God's always giving the Word in advance. He's always giving you preparation for what's coming next in your life. So be ready for those type of attacks from Satan and deceptions to get you to doubt the love of God. So the light has already been revealed to us in this area. So we're not going to continue to buy his lies in our hearts. We know from the word that God's love is indestructible. And we believers are his for all eternity because his love cannot fail. So another satanic deception has been thwarted by the word of God, shining light in our souls to give us the right perspective. And that's why the Apostle John tells us there is no fear in love. Don't listen to the whisperer, the serpent, whispering in your ear, hissing in your ear, trying to get your attention trying to make you doubt. There's no fear in love. And this is a progressive thing. This isn't like one day you finally reach perfect faith in God's love. But let's read this on our own in 1 John 4.15. Let's just expand on this idea. 1 John 4.15. Again, John tells us there's no fear in love. Satan wants us to fear. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. You see what God wants for us? By this, love is perfected with us, that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. No fear, in other words. There is no fear in love, verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. Again, the one who fears is not perfected in love. That's what Satan's trying to keep us from. On the board, the more we believe in God's love and how unfailing it is towards his children, the less we will have any fears in this life. And again, this is a progressive thing. 
that we get closer and closer, kind of on the asymptote thing, closer and closer to God's love, the more we believe in it, the more we, you know, denounce Satan's lies, where he's trying to get us to fear things like losing God's love. You know, when you, when you know fear is attacking you, you want to stare, stare, stare at it straight in the face. When you know there are forces trying to get you not to do something because of fear, you should go the stronger at it. Because that is a tactic from Satan just trying to trick you. He doesn't want you to bring glory to God. Just think about it. But one of those things is God's love. He's trying to get us to doubt God's love, to fear that God's love is going to leave us in some way, which is impossible according to the Word of God. The only thing to truly fear would be God leaving us, and that's impossible because God has perfect faithfulness. In Hebrews 13, he tells us he will never leave us or forsake us. Never. And in Romans 8, we've seen that nothing can separate us from the love of God, the love of Christ. Nothing. So again, take that, Satan. I want to say something else earlier, but we're recording this message. Take that, Satan. That's another one off the shelf. As long as we account it to our own, you know, soul. As long as we have faith in what the Word says. So we might say on the board, take a pause here. Thank you for showing us the perfect goodness of your love, Lord. As perfect as the perfect love of a perfect father. Doesn't get any more perfect than that. Thank you for showing us the perfect goodness of your love, Lord. As perfect as the perfect love of a perfect father. He is the reason that his love never fails us, not us. He's the reason his love never fails us. Once we get that into our thick skulls and stop doubting, then we realize it's not about us maintaining or earning his love in any way. And we must remember that as we fail from time to time, because we all do. So to tie this in to our our lessons, we talked on Tuesday about the love of a mother and how it is a visual aid of the love of God for his children. Why did God set up life like this? He didn't have to do it this way. That a mother has a child out of her own body after nine months and the intimacy and the the, um, unexplainable attachment to one another and the unexplainable ferocity a mother will have to protect her children. All a picture of God's love for us. And that is in an imperfect human being. And that exists. How much does God love us? It's crazy. And so we are called His adopted children, right? We are adopted children of His once we believe in Christ. And if you want to read more on that, you can read Ephesians chapter 1 and Romans chapter 8. But we are his adopted children. If an earthly parent can adopt a child in this world and love him like his own, how perfectly do you think God loves us? If a sinner can do that with an adopted child, how perfectly do you think God loves us as his adopted ones? Perfect. There's no gap in his love and there's no weakness in his love. And God doesn't change his mind, so says his word. God has adopted believers as his own children once for all. And that means we possess and can even experience his perfect, unbreakable love in our lives. If we allow the word to shine on our souls and receive it in humility. So another one of Satan's deceptions is squashed by the word. There's no fear in love. Back to our series title, The Power of Deception. We again recall that Satan uses deception and trickery against us, and he does so in an an insidious way. Go to 2 Corinthians 11. Try saying that a couple times. 
He does so in an insidious way. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Satan uses deception and trickery. And he does it in the worst of ways. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. What a slime ball he is, right? What a jerk. To present himself one way as a quote-unquote nice guy, um, a loving person even. And, you know, he has a knife behind his back waiting to take it out at the right time. He presents himself as something good to fool the unsuspecting and often target the innocent. That's who we're dealing with. But we need to be humble if we're going to avoid his trickery. And what I mean is our attitude towards the word again. Deliverance from deception. This came up on Tuesday. Only the word of God is able to shine light on deception. We are not shrewd enough to see it by ourselves. Be humble, folks, right? Don't think you are shrewd enough to see it by yourself or to see it without being in the Word every day. You know, ah, I, you know, I go to church, church on Sunday. I'm always praying. Don't think you're shrewd enough to see it on your own. Only the Word gives us 20-20 vision to help us see things spiritually, clearly, as they're meant to be seen by God. But the world has gradually perverted our perspective on many things over the years. Again, think about how long it might have taken you to come to a point where you said, if you did, we shouldn't have children in this crazy world. How long and how slowly did that build in your soul? But the Word is what shines light and gives clarity so that our perspective can be pure. That's what we want, isn't it? We want a pure perspective on everything, like Christ himself has. A pure perspective on everything, despite what the world is, you know, and what sight says in the world. You know, that looks horrible. (laughs) That looks horrible, so I'm not going to go there. Where the word might say something totally different, and you have to go by faith and Look fear straight in the face. On the board, perspective is everything. If you lack it, you lack divine viewpoint. If you're standing on your head, the world is upside down to you, making it really hard to make any sense of it. The problem is that if those around you are also standing on their heads, you all begin to agree collectively with the wrong perspective. It's so easy. It's so easy to give in. If you have five people around you, your friends, even people that you love and trust to some degree, and they're all standing on their their heads, it's very easy for them to convince you to just try it. (laughs) Just try it. It's not that bad. You say it's slavery, it's not that bad. It's actually pretty good. Look at all the stuff I have. So be on guard. On the board, Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. As believers, we must remember that we're not going to get any help at all from the world. Stop. So we we need to stop looking to the world for help. And we do this very subtly. This isn't like, you know, If I asked you the question, do you look to the world for help, you're going to say no. And you probably think you don't. But when you you lean towards someone for encouragement or approval, someone in the world, maybe you esteem something about them, they have some street credibility with you, something about them you're attracted to. So, So you have a tendency to give them an extra ear. You know, maybe they're a quote unquote good person or a smart person or whatever. And so... 
it's very easy, easy for you to be swayed towards the world's ways through their mouth and through their actions. So be on guard. That's what God is saying. Don't look to people in the world that aren't in the word. Don't look to them for advice. What are they going to give you? They might even give you moral advice, but it might be a wrong perspective, a worldly perspective. So don't hang on the word of others in the world. Be on guard that Satan is using uh, people, even people you love, to bring deception to you. Okay, this doesn't mean <laughs> cut yourself off from all contact from people in the world. That's not what it means. It means take things with a grain of salt. It means don't take things as gospel, as people steal that word. Just be on the alert. All right, so our job is to stand firm in the truth. To patiently endure and hold fast to the truth of the word, despite distractions and attacks in this world. I'm currently reading the book of Revelation, and something jumped out at me in chapters 1 through 3 when the Lord was addressing the seven churches. What was said over and over in these three chapters, probably five or six times, was to patiently endure and to hold fast. In some translations, the word perseverance is used. Patiently endure and hold fast. God loves that kind of faith. That's, a, that's, that's faith. And he loves when we don't quit. In the face of confusion in the world, maybe. Temptations in the world. Loves when we don't quit. When we patiently endure and hold fast. That's beautiful to him. God is asking us as his children to not listen to the lies, but to stand firm in the truth and not be swayed by those in the world who might even love us, but they're standing on their heads. And they make things sound good, but they're standing on their heads. Their perspective is off, even opposite what it should be. So stand firm. Patiently endure on the board. Don't listen to their skewed perspectives in the world, but patiently endure and hold fast to my word, says the Lord in Revelations chapter 2 and 3. Don't listen to their skewed perspectives in the world, but patiently endure and hold fast to my word. In other words, don't let it go. Don't let it go like life depends on it. If we do that, the word works its miracles inside our souls and protects us from the lies. Right? We've all experienced that. If you've been faithful to the Lord, you've experienced God just like he rescued us from a, a false earthly perspective on bearing children. He works miracles. The word works miracles in our souls if we're humble. Another deception that came up on Tuesday is that people aren't personally responsible to God for their sins. They're not, they don't think they're personally responsible to God for their sins. And they think that it's okay to make excuses for things that they have no control over, or that, I'm sorry, that they do have control over. They think it's okay to make excuses for things that they do have control over, that they have the freedom to choose for or against, in other words. Think about this. The Holy Spirit reaches out to every man individually by grace. Every man, woman on this earth, the Holy Spirit is reaching out to. So each man is responsible for his own decisions, especially regarding what they think about Christ. But Satan has sold our society on the saying that it's not your fault. He sold almost everybody that that is an okay way to think. It's not your fault about almost everything. And this came up on Tuesday. The everyone's a victim lie. Satan has done a great job at convincing the world that personal responsibility is a lie. 
what rightly ought to be attributed to individuals is now spread across communities. Individuals are no longer to blame. Sin itself eluded. This is the root cause of a lot of problems in our country right now, as many of you know. It's only when people decide to stand up and be a man, claiming responsibility for their own personal decisions, that they can be on the road to recovery and freedom in whatever area of sin. It's only when people stand up and decide to be a man and take responsibility for their own decisions that they can be on the road to freedom. And that's one thing maybe we can pray for for our country is that the next generation takes responsibility, realizes they're accountable to God, and turns to Christ by grace. But these days it's no longer popular to actually call a sin a sin. You know, people don't want to hurt people's feelings. It's crazy. All, you know, it's okay to lie so you don't hurt people's feelings. And the example that came up on Tuesday is living life as a drunk. And while we all have different sins we deal with in our lives, this is just the example that came up on Tuesday. It's a simple example. While a person might have had bad influences in their lives or a tough life, objectively speaking, is it their choice or not to pick up the bottle? And there have been many cases of two children growing up in the same household with a drunk father, and one of the children follows in dad's footsteps and becomes an alcoholic. The other child won't touch one drop of alcohol his whole life. What does that reveal to us? Free will is in play. We're responsible for our personal decisions. And we can choose to live in sin or not. There is personal responsibility for what each of us does with our own lives. No one, else, no one else forces us to live our lives a certain way, a certain lifestyle, let's call it. The decisions we have um, freedom with are decisions that are our responsibility. Okay? There are things that happen in life, there are things that people don't have freedom of choice with, let's say, but the things that you have a choice with are yours. You, you own it, as the Spirit has been saying to us. Let's get right to that point on the board. God says, own it. Sin is accounted to individuals. If you sin, it's your sin, not anyone else's. If you miss out on God's blessings as a result, it's your fault, not anyone else's. So stop blaming other people like a dysfunctional family or some organization, etc. But the world loves the blame game all to enable people and help them run from their problems. And it's a shame because it's not the path to freedom. It's the path to more slavery. And we saw this on Tuesday also on the board, the phantom owner of sin. Sin is accounted to individuals, so says Holy Scripture. When a sinner says, it's not my fault I sin, they're attempting to evade personal responsibility by placing it on a phantom owner. For example, Society, parents, abusers, etc. But this is the root of the problem. This is the root of so many symptoms in our country today. And when this came up on Tuesday, I was reminded of a passage in Luke 13 that we're all somewhat familiar with, where Jesus tells people they are each responsible for their own sins and their lack of repentance regarding them. You might know the passage I'm talking about, but go to uh, Luke 13, 1, and let's read it again. Luke 13, 1. Again, Jesus basically tells people they are each responsible for their own sins and for their lack of repentance regarding them. The Lord was very honest and direct so that no one would be deceived into thinking they weren't personally responsible to him. Luke 13, 1. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners 
than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. In other words, it's just not your time yet. You think you're better than them because that didn't happen to you? Well, there's still time. <laughs> there's still time. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And to teach us that true repentance always results in good fruit, he goes on and tells this parable in verse 6. And he began telling this parable, a man has a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? You see the analogy here? Like, let the tower fall on the people. It's their time. And God's like, no, give them another year. Give them more time to repent. In verse 8, he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. The Lord was graciously saying to all, You are responsible for your own decisions and your own sins. In particular, repent of your sinfulness against God and follow me. Is what Christ was saying before it's your turn. Here we see there is mercy for those who repent, but judgment for those who refuse. And Jesus is basically saying it's your choice. No one can choose for you, and you can't blame anyone else. Turn to Philippians 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, 12. The Bible is full of uh, personal accountability. And we're even told to worry about ourselves in terms of our relationship with God, not worry about others and not judge others. Look at Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation. Whose salvation? Your salvation. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for His good pleasure. So we're not to judge. We're not to look at others' lives or, or sanctification. We're to worry about our own between us and God. We're personally responsible to God. And that's a healthy perspective. We each have enough to worry about when we consider our personal responsibility to God. And, as verse 13 says, thank God He's the one at work in the person who humbles himself before Him. Thank God. So, we saw this on Tuesday also regarding root causes. The root cause for evil is lack of good. Better yet, the root cause is a rejection of good, namely Christ, the Good Shepherd. Those without him are rudderless. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16, Luke 20, 21 through 26. So let's turn to Ephesians 4 again as we begin to close. Ephesians 4, 14. Again, the root cause for evil is lack of good. Better yet, the root cause is a rejection of good. Christ himself, the good shepherd. Those without him are rudderless. Ephesians 4:14. 4, As a result, we are no longer to be children. What is this saying here? This isn't talking about having the faith of a child. That's a good thing. We're no longer to be children. In other words, don't be deceived. Stop being naive. Like children believe everything, right? You've been trained in the word. No longer be children. Open your eyes. Be on the lookout. No longer be 
children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and by craftiness in deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And there again we see the warning to not be deceived, but instead be built up in love. But no longer be children, folks. Don't be a sucker for the trickery of men. Don't, don't see the hook with a little bait on it and say, all right, I'll bite it again. Why not? Maybe it's not a sharp hook this time. Maybe the hook's made of candy. What, what excuses do we want to keep giving? In other words, stop being a child. Stop being a dumb fish that bites at the hook every time. Stop being a dumb sheep. You're trained in the word. Be on the lookout for trickery and deceitful scheming. Jesus was on the lookout in Luke 20, verse 21. Go to Luke 20, 21 again. Luke 20, 21. We saw this on Tuesday where they purposely tried to trick the Lord. They obviously didn't realize who they were dealing with. They questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to any, but teach the way of God in truth. So they buttered him up first. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he detected their trickery and said to them, Show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were unable to catch him. Their point is they were trying to catch him. They were unable to catch him in a saying in the presence of the people. And being amazed at his answer, they became silent. So we mustn't be deceived. People are going to purposely try to catch us. Purposely try to trick us. Even knowing that we're believers, they will purposely come up with a scheme to catch us in our own words, to whatever. Embarrass the Lord indirectly. But only the living word can detect trickery, and deceitfulness from Satan and his agents. Only the living word. Jesus right here is the living word. And he caught, he understood it all, what was going on. Now we have the living word available to us. He's inside of us. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. And we have the written word too. Right? So we have the only weapon that can defeat the deceptions in our possession if we are humble. And so we can detect trickery like Jesus did here because the word shines the light, the spotlight on it. And the spirit of Jesus also can make us in tune to the things that might be coming our way, to the trickery of men and the craftiness and deceitful scheming in Ephesians 4. So thank God for that. But it takes humility I mean, true humility, like submission, like surrender to his word is the only way. It takes that to be able to enjoy the freedom and to have the spotlight shine so that we don't fall. So we'll close with this. Be careful for the words of those people who have an agenda in your life. This came up on Tuesday also. Be careful for the words of those that have an agenda in your life that may be against your faith, your beliefs, that may be against the way you live, and they have an, another opinion on what lifestyle is okay. Be on guard for those nice people that approach you that have an agenda, that may have an agenda, to get you to come on their side, to get you to stand upside down on your head, even for just a little while so they can prove you're a, 
a liar or a hypocrite or whatever they're trying to prove. Be careful. Those who disagree with the word will look for every corner case in your life even to discourage you from trusting the Lord. That's another tactic of Satan. Don't trust the Lord. You know? Don't trust the Lord. Just like doubting the Lord's love. Doubt that the Lord is for you. We know from the word that God always has a plan, even when evil things happen in someone's life, right? God always has a plan. We know that. That's what we cling to. That's what the word tells us very, very clearly and wonderfully and directly. God always has a plan. But there are going to be people coming at you with an agenda to try to make you doubt that God always has a plan, even when evil things happen. They can't see straight. They're upside down, remember. So they try to convince you with all their heart to see like them. In all the sincerity that they can muster. And maybe they are being sincere. They're just deceived, right? You're deceived. You don't know that what you're saying or trying to convince someone of is wrong. And so they're going to come after you through Satan, Satan's influence, through the kingdom of darkness's influence in their lives. Don't buy it. As Pastor said on Tuesday... Our job is to see behind the curtain. To even look behind the curtain. Don't think there's not a curtain there, in other words, when certain people approach you. There is an agenda. There is a curtain. There is an ulterior motive in a lot of people's hearts to try to deceive you. Look for Satan's fingerprints as he uses worldly people to try to deceive you. Don't be naive again. Uh, don't be children tossed here and there. We're no longer to be that way. And also came up on Tuesday the pattern of Satan's agents. Even though they're unwittingly used most of the time, the pattern is to use flattering speech to rope us in, like they tried to do to the Lord. Use flattering speech to bring you in, and then, as Pastor mentioned on Tuesday, slam us with loaded questions. Questions designed to try to trap us. Don't fall for it. You might not even want to answer the question. You might want to answer the question with a question and let them think about what they're asking you. Don't fall for the trickery of men. That's what the Spirit's saying. So on the board, we'll close again with the main point. Satanic deception. We must always remember that Satan is a master of deception. He's really, really good at it. The most effective deceptions are the least obvious. Only the Word of God is able to shine light on them to reveal their insidiousness. Amen? All right, let's bow. Father, we thank you again so much. We thank you for your Word that you provided that is perfect and complete and has all the answers to life within the pages. We thank you for the living word, Jesus Christ, and his spirit within us to guide us, to alert us, and to show us how to apply the word to life. And Father, we ask that you protect us and guide us as we go out into the world trying to evangelize and save some souls, that you help us be aware and alert for the trickery of men that comes at us. Help us not be children tossed here and there by waves and deceive so easily. Help us to submit and surrender to your word as our only hope, the only light that can be shined on the deceptions. Father, we ask that you bless us all as we go, and it's in Christ's precious name we pray, by the power of your spirit. Amen. Amen.